Podcast number one is with the talented yet humbled multi-international representative Talisha Harden. Hear from her experiences as a young Indigenous female growing up in Woodridge and the path she's been on as a sporting success and university graduate in speech pathology. T opens up to us about impacting events that have helped shape her journey. She speaks about coming out with her sexuality, managing positive and negative relationships and the ongoing investment for herself to ensure her mental health is priority to perform as a player and as a person. Welcome to our very first podcast. If you want to hear more, sub yourself in. Kia ora, hello and welcome to Subbed, a raw but genuine space for our players and athletes, our idols and sportswomen to give insight into their journeys of becoming the unapologetically talented females that they are. Hear the struggles and adversity and celebrations of diversity as we peel back and sub you in into some of the most powerful and untold experiences of what it is to be a successful female in sport. I'll start again. Okay. Good? Yep. Okay, cool. So, welcome to our very first podcast here today with Talisha Harden. Um, there I go again. Same up, but anyway, we'll just carry on. <laughs> um, so I've got a very talented sportswoman here with me, uh, quadruple international representative uh, through volleyball, beach volleyball. Yeah. Didn't didn't rep Oz, but got to Queensland level for ah, beach. Yeah, yeah. but yep. n- normal or indoor. Yep, indoor yep. volleyball, rugby league, uh, rugby union sevens. And nines, or take nines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, so times. yeah, welcome. Um, thank you for coming on to our very first podcast that we have for Subbed. I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself properly, um, and then let us know what sport you're currently in today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Herbs, yeah, and welcome. for everyone. Thank you, and for everyone listening, how's it going? Um, no, I guess for me, yeah, journey through a few different sports took a bit of a roundabout way to get where I am right now um so yeah wasn't very good at sport growing up was actually really unco um and then kind of found a niche with indoor volleyball all through high school um and did that alongside beach volleyball for a long time so beach in the in the summer indoor through autumn winter and a little bit into spring and the rest was yeah beach volleyball um and then got to about 18 or 19 was just after a bit of a change so joined uh, Sunny Mac Rugby League Union Club mm-hmm. um, did that for for a few years and loved that. Um, met some great people who introduced me to rugby sevens. I guess sevens is the same. It was more of a summer type sport or that mm-hmm. December through February sport. Um, so I did a little bit of sevens and then some rugby union. Um, I was very fortunate as well. Sorry, with volleyball to represent um, Australia at junior youth and senior level and um, represented. Um, the Australian Women's Sevens team um, on a couple of occasions as well, which was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, an out of this world experience. It was yeah, amazing. Um, and then journeyed over into rugby league. And yeah, that's kind of where I'm sitting today. And I've been very fortunate to play for Queensland, um, Australia, the Indigenous All Stars, um, and a few other teams as well. How cool. So, like I said, a smorgasbord of um, sports representing at. Uh, almost the highest level that you can represent so thank you for coming on and um, I'm interested to hear how that journey got you to where you are today so uh, you said back in the day sport wasn't really your thing so maybe we can um, wander back to a young Talisha growing up what was life like where did you grow up Um, what was your environments and Sort of influences because obviously there were some pretty positive um, things to come out of that for you to be where you're at today. Yeah, hundred percent. I grew up in Woodridge and still live in Woodridge. So mm-hmm. yeah, as most people would know, if you Google Woodridge, the first few things that pop up aren't good. Um, but in saying that, it's such a cool community to be a part of. Very multicultural. Um, you know, some of my best mates growing up were Vietnamese, Samoan, Tongan. Um, Filipino so mm-hmm. yeah it was diverse really bunch of people really diverse and I think that probably set me up for later in life and it's probably why I enjoy 
so much now talking to different people and why mm-hmm. I'm probably so accepting and loving of different cultures and things like that. I don't think I probably would have got that, not having grown up in in a community like I did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it came from a really kind of working class family. Um, didn't know we were we were poor growing up because we just had so much fun and yeah. you know mum and dad worked so hard and they just made life really enjoyable um, my best mate lived right next door and we just had the best kind of childhood she was one of seven kids so um, we used to spend literally every afternoon we took down the middle bits of our fence and we used to play tennis over the um, <laughs> like the side of the fence yeah and pretending we were yeah pretending we were Serena Williams and Venus Williams in the backyard but yeah, um, no I just think that I just had such a, a pretty cool childhood and I saw how hard my my family and my parents worked and yeah. everyone in my family too like they were all such hard workers and um, yeah I guess that's something I always kind of took with me through childhood yeah um, not many Indigenous kids at my school in yeah, particular, okay. like, you know, being a, a proud Indigenous Australian, um, proud Indigenous person. It's, it's yeah, it wasn't something kind of, yeah. I guess I didn't have lots of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends growing up because I think there were only oh, a handful of us at school. Um, it was a school that was pretty dominated by um, Pacific Islander kids. Yeah. Okay. Um, but in saying that, you know, you just you just adapt and at that age you don't honestly you don't you don't care your, your mates your mate your friends your friend you look yeah. past culture and religion and all that and yeah I just had such a good um a good childhood and um yeah I guess was never good at sport was really gamming at it like yeah. just didn't have any <laughs> hair like coordination I was okay at athletics yeah um, okay but we had a pretty small school, so it wasn't too hard to win the 100 metres or the yeah. the 400 or 200 metres, whatever we ran. Like, yeah. um, But, you know, we just had a good time. Okay. Um, so how did you find your way into volleyball? Um, because, obviously, you were quite uh, successful at that at such a young age. So where, did, um, where were you introduced into volleyball and who was to thank for that? Um, in high school, uh, oh, year okay. eight, yeah, I started to play volleyball. I, I kind of started halfway through the year in year eight because I just was, I was like, I'm gambling at sport, I'm not playing anything. Like, yeah. Where's the, I was a bit into my music back then, so I played an yeah. instrument. Yeah, yeah. Um, what instrument did I, you play? I played the tenor horn. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, which was really cool. So I was part of Beanley Brass Band back in the day. Um Good. But no, I, I kind of had a growth spurt when I was about 12, mm. so I just jumped up in height so much, and I had a really, probably a big wingspan, like, I think my wingspan's about 190 centimetres, and I'm 178, so my, my arms are quite long compared to my body. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, just volleyball coach was also my HPE teacher, and okay. he was like, oh, you know, come and play volleyball, and from there it just kind of kick-started yeah. into, yeah, and I had my uncle, he um, he coached a bit of volleyball at the University of Queensland yeah. at the time and so mum rang him I remember and she was like should she play is it a good sport will she get hurt and um, he encouraged me to play so yeah I played that and was really yeah really fortunate did did yeah kind of every level you can do with um, indoor volleyball in particular mm-hmm. um, Queensland school girls Australian school girls yeah, Queensland yeah. and Australian youth and junior teams um, Queensland senior women's team, yeah. like a bit of everything. everything was looking at do. was looking at colleges um, in the US and in Canada okay. to go to, but then um, decided to stay um, and do my university here in Australia when I kind of got to that year eleven, year twelve age. Yeah, yeah. okay, because that was something that I did want to touch on. Was that um, I'll let you explain um, the career path that you've chosen to go down, but obviously you've gone to university and that requires um, a big commitment in itself so if you want to let us know um, what it is that you did go to university and study for and um, also how did you juggle those sporting commitments Um, because it wasn't just like a social weekly sort of setup that you were involved in like you were um, top of the line kind of training schedules and whatnot yeah it was hectic I mean coming from I guess school volleyball where you know you it's really there's lots of routine around it like you know you've got to be at training at seven o'clock in the morning you've got Mm. school all day and then you might go and train at night four or five times a week we were doing that in school so it was really structured and there's heaps of routine and then kind of jumping over to uni where yeah I wanted to study speech pathology um I guess with my background with middle ear infections and some hearing difficulties and some speech and language difficulties yeah um that was the 
career I really wanted to pursue. Did that um, affect, just so touching on the hearing and like the speech, those sorts of issues, did that affect your schooling at all or not really? A little bit. Like I'd probably say year one and two, I was an average student. Mm, yeah. Um, and then I was put into the ESL classes in primary school. So English as a second language classes. Oh, yeah. Um, because they were like, oh, you know, we can't really understand this kid. She's a bit, uh, she kind of mumbles and jumbles and yeah, right. throws words around and lingo everywhere. So, um, yeah, I was put into ESL and I had a, an awesome lady, um, Annie Wendy, she was an Aboriginal lady. Yeah. And she used to take me in there. She wasn't a speech pathologist, but she used yeah. to go through all the exercises with me. She used okay. to record me. Um, so I could hear myself speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, right. And then same thing, kind of when I got to uni, um, again, I was still training four or five nights a week at mm-hmm. um, the Queensland Academy of Sport um, with, you know, for indoor volleyball. Was doing uh, club volleyball with the University of Queensland at the time, and still trying to juggle full-time speech pathology study. And in those first two years of speech, it's it's so content heavy. Yeah. Um, lots and lots of work. Um, and I also started playing of course rugby union kind of when I hit that age too so I was doing indoor volleyball and rugby union yeah um and I mean they were nights too especially I think you know being 18 19 um where I guess I kind of um you know found a really cool group of friends with rugby union and we used to you know we used to go out and we used to have a good time and things like that too so um you know juggling that with sport and doing all those things was tricky yeah um but always kind of found a way to make it work okay. I think um just by prioritizing okay. I guess more of the uni yeah over the going outside of things but in saying yeah, that good at that yeah <laughs> but in saying that did find a good balance I think like I I had some really good times where I did get to catch up with my friends when when I wanted to and um yeah yeah and what was the tipping point where you decided I've achieved all I've all I wanted to achieve in volleyball if that's what your thought process was or or what made you decide I'm going to make the complete change of codes and go into rugby union um, and leave volleyball behind I think it was a couple of things um the Mm. first one being that you know I was really starting to enjoy sevens in particular um and just the body type requirements for like sevens and indoor volleyball is so completely different like yeah, yeah. you know the max sprint in indoor volleyball is probably a meter and a half um whereas for rugby sevens you know you're you're doing Going a lot days. more yeah you're running a lot more and then yeah. um I, I was just starting to break down like my body just couldn't kind of handle rolling around on floorboards and then yeah. going and running around getting tackled yeah um and then there was actually I was in um Japan when uh the grand final was on where uh, we lost to Redlands that day and I wasn't there. I missed the grand final. You were playing. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. I won. Yeah, yeah. I was in Japan that day. Um, yeah, we got a huge job. <laughs> we, got, we, got, we smashed the whole season. And, like, I was in Japan representing the Australian indoor volleyball team and, like, it was that it was hard too because I was like, but I really want to be playing my like my local league yeah. grand final. Yeah, it's just club footy. Yeah, and I think that was when, mm. like... And that's no disrespect to volleyball at all. That's just at that particular time, mm-hmm. I was like so concerned about how the grand final was going. And I thought, yeah. okay, if, if my heart's fully towards yeah. um, rugby union or sevens or whatever it was at the time, you know, both probably, yeah. then that's the way I need to go. Yeah, cool. Um, and it's quite cool to be that in touch with what you your gut instinct sort of is telling you to do. Yeah. Because so many people hold on to sport for so long for whatever reason whether it be the appearance or you know what I mean Mm. so to make the change is pretty bold thing to do and I can't even remember what year that was 2011 or 2012 or something like it was it was a while ago but yeah yeah, I remember it pretty clearly yeah Yeah, I remember that one point pretty clearly (laughs) actually no no 2013 yeah it was definitely 2013 yeah Yeah. now that I remember yeah 2013 one point yeah and then one point the following year from UQ from UQ yeah yeah we don't need it (laughs) (laughs) so yeah so anyway so you um successfully made the switch into rugby sevens and that propelled forward uh what was your experiences going through rugby sevens um to obviously 
non-contact contact you know all sorts of things on and off field stuff would be a lot different too yeah big change um had to get the kilometers in my legs that's for sure like mm. um and because i the, the years before i kind of split conditioning between like sevens and volleyball so i kind of hadn't done a full 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 like sevens lots of i guess pre-season or seven yeah. lots of running so yeah. um no that was hard that's anyone who thinks sevens is easy is completely like yeah. lying to themselves it's such a hard sport yeah um a different breed such a hard sport like those those girls especially now like you think back a few years ago and just mm. how much the standards improved now and how fit and fast and powerful like Elliot green bench pressing what 100 and <laughs> was that 120 or something 100 yeah and, something like that's that. ridiculous isn't it like she's oh she's it's a not machine. where we were at <laughs> No, nah, and even seeing Varney crack like a 90 kilo clean, I think yeah, the other day she did. Yeah, I saw that as well. Yeah, like that's massive. Yeah. That's huge for them. So, yeah, no, loved it. Um, like loved the, the training side of things. Like I think that's something I've probably always picked up from mum and dad is that value of hard work and yeah. knowing things aren't going to be kind of handed to you. And that I guess that was the hardest bit too is that kind of coming into sevens is probably like a, a newbie, like not having ever played a ball sport before yeah. touching a rugby union ball, um, as in like, sorry, a, a round sport ball. Yeah. But before that with volleyball going into an oval shaped ball, like it was hard. Yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed it. Like I found a few things I was good at, um, a few things I definitely wasn't good at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was very lucky. I got to got to make my debut in Amsterdam, and um, yeah. I think Charlotte Caslick and Varney um, made their debut that round too, and that's crazy. Yeah. Like that that still trips me out a bit. Um, that's so a got cool to, caliber of players to make your debut. It's with. a fun fun crew to debut with, and yeah, I remember Cherry was my roommate, and because I got called in late too. Okay. So Cherry had this sign on the bed because she was at physio or something. I think she was like. Welcome, Rumi. Congrats on your debut. So that was really cool. Yeah. Um, and then played in Shanghai with you. Um, yeah, that's right. And then just before that, did Oceana as well with um, with the Aussie team too, which was cool. So won the Oceana title. Yeah. Um, and this was all during the time where uh, Sevens wasn't quite. It hadn't quite gone professional yet, had it? No, no. no. So there yeah. was still. So you were still studying. Still studying. still studying yeah i was in my second year of studying yeah um so how did the travel i just jumping back and forth so you're still you've almost tipped over again to another code we are touring away you're still trying to maintain um university or higher education commitments did it how did you how did you do it because I don't remember, all I ever focused on was playing and mm. turning up and I don't ever remember seeing you like with the books out and that kind of thing, was that, how did you manage? I think it was like, yeah, it was a lot of behind the scenes yeah. work. Yeah, um, and that, does that go back to again like that work ethic that your parents have instilled in Yeah, you know, to just get it done and I remember there were times like oh there was definitely one time in my second year where I, I didn't study well enough for an mm. exam and yeah. I remembered I had this sick feeling in my stomach going into the exam um this sick feeling during the exam and a completely like even worse feeling coming out of the exam because I was like no nah, I've bombed this yeah I think I was lucky that a few like almost a majority of the cohort probably didn't do um as enough yeah as well on it as well maybe or maybe in my head I don't know what happened somehow I passed that exam I'll just <laughs> put it down to maybe it was bell curved or yeah. maybe maybe I just passed but I, I just never wanted to ever feel that yeah. again yeah. so like I was like oh my gosh like I don't want to be that person who who fails yeah. uni because I, I could have not failed like I, I had all the time to yeah. oh, I could have made time to do it so yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's I guess that's like um like I know for myself, like uh, you put so much pressure on yourself and you, it's almost like that fear of failure, that, mm. um, which you should have ultimately, if you're at that level, shouldn't put yourself into that position of like playing with fire. But for me, like that always just like not so much on the sporting field, but a deadline. Mm. I've got all the time in the world, but I will work to the deadline to the last minute and get it to done get it done somehow. Yeah. So I don't know. Is it? Do your skill? Does your work ethic 
off field translate on field or just out of curiosity or oh that's really interesting i think um i'm probably now they mm. probably more aligned like i'm i'm kind of a more chilled like leave yeah. it last minute type of person yeah but back when i was at uni like i was mm. pretty diligent like i used to set time when i'd put things that, uh, probably because i had to be whereas now i'm like oh, i'm a bit older yeah. whereas back then i had to be a little bit more like hyper organized yeah, to get it done okay. but then off on the field i was a bit the opposite back then like i was very chilled out so yeah, yeah i think off field i've become a lot more relaxed mm-hmm. about thing and i mean probably the hardest thing during uni was more my mum kind of getting in her accident That's uh, right. yeah, so okay. that was probably the biggest kind of contributor to maybe like my stress off field like I yeah and that's even another thing in the bucket like I had uni yeah um had family stuff with mum had sport so yeah there's yeah, a lot going on heaps going on yeah especially for a 19 20 year old yeah kid that's basically right. yeah and then uh fast track to I can't even remember 2014 or 15 when the national program did centralize and it did go professional and your uh, journey down there was slightly different. How was that? Do you want to explain how yeah. that goes actually? Yeah, what yeah. that involved? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, the previous year, I've been lucky to kind of yeah, go on that Amsterdam um, tour. And then uh, when the program was relocated centrally to Sydney the following year, um, I was more in that wider kind of training squad. So it wasn't yeah. initially offered um, uh, an elite contract so a paid contract um like a lot of the girls we were getting at the time but still just wanted to give it a crack like it was yeah. like and it was what? encouraged wasn't yeah. It? yeah yeah 100 percent. like i remember kind of saying to um you know the coaches at the time i said oh do you think i should or shouldn't i'm really keen what do you reckon they're like yeah yeah come like yeah of course like you know <laughs> and i was like yeah all right so um and even though i wasn't in that that squad like i just wanted to yeah give it a crack and um one of the girls uh mums who's absolutely amazing patty um like let me stay at her place and um, you know i was just commuting from the central coast over to to narrabeen um almost every day or crashing on cheech and elia's couch or over at (laughs) your place with shano like wherever i could kind of crash if i didn't want to drive back but yeah how long was the drive uh it was about an hour 20 sometimes depends if if you left too early it was like four hours like yeah depends on the pacific highway but um which is a that's a that's a lot after like it's not just a training like this was the australian team's training yeah and a lot it's those were big days yeah you know we lived five minutes up the road and i would just go home and die every day (laughs) so yeah an hour and a half drive would have just been taxing as it was yeah and i'm I'm, like i'm pretty glad i did it because it was like a year kind of it was about eight months living away from home so i got that kind of you know that little bit of independence even though patty was was awesome she cook and yeah she was the best but even like little things like you know getting a job and just even just being a little bit more independent and you know i got a job with um with lloydies so i did a bit of work with lloydies um just kind of randomly and then just picked up a bit here and there and i was lucky though i had some money saved um so kind of but you know didn't have too many outgoing expenses at that time yeah and um yeah just kind of made it made it work and have absolutely no shame in saying that like i wasn't able to kind of you know crack that that next level so moved home in in october um of that year and then ended up getting selected to play for the Australian girls at, at Noosa that year that's um, right which was really cool yeah. so it was kind of like okay you know that chapter's kind of closed but then um I started to play some I guess some good footy again and yeah um, got to play with the Aussie girls that year at Noosa um, right. but I'd done some random things that year I mean like I was kind of training with the girls mm-hmm. um, and you guys um with the Australian seven stuff and then I went to Africa that year um for six weeks <laughs> um i went to paris and london with the tribe crew so yeah. yeah i did some random stuff that year so it was just a bit of a like miscellaneous year yeah. in life but it was so cool like it was actually yeah, a really good year and how did that uh impact you i guess so what was in africa 
That wasn't sport, was it? No, that was like a volunteer program for six weeks where we just went out to like a, a rural community right. um, and built like built gardens and refurbished a classroom and just ran sports programs kind of for kids, but not yeah. really programs. Like we kind of, that's the only thing we could really do was like run sport because kids, yeah. kids love sport. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was good. It was six weeks and like, you yeah. know, just seeing how some of those kids um, are living. Like there were kids who were like 10 who know how to concrete and you're wow. like, what the, and who know how to like tile. Yeah. Okay. Um, and they just don't sweat the small stuff. And yeah. I, I think that really impacted me as a person. But I also yeah. lost a lot of weight um, when I was in um, South Africa. Yeah, um, okay. Not through anything in particular. I think just... For what you were doing. Yeah, just labouring every day. So yeah. to all the labourers out there, labouring is Hats off. tough work. Yeah, uh, yeah. so that was um, that whole year, I guess. Uh, you know, like a lot of people... Uh, like it wasn't a year off. It definitely was not a year off. But you crammed in a, a stack of stuff, um, including playing for Australia, travelling to volunteer just as an all-round good human, coming back. Um, mum was unwell. Mum was unwell, yeah. Yeah, and then you just sort of switched again into another code and went skyrocketed to the top of that one also like how did then that transition come about it's sort of like you're just going through the motions casually playing for the national women's teams like you know what I mean like it's, yeah so for most people like that's a really out there bloody achievement for yourself you're like oh yeah and then I just downplayed it and cruised into another sport <laughs> you know is that what it was really like or is that um how did you oh. go and come about and then go into league it was good because when I kind of transitioned from sevens mm. to league yeah. um it was just it was just supposed to be a one-off carnival yeah. uh, like the Murray carnival mm. uh Nikki Muller asked me to play because she did a bit of union stuff and a bit of league stuff with yeah. all the indigenous girls so yeah. she was like yeah come play and I was like oh yeah why not like um played and just loved it but yeah. I guess I was super, like pretty fit from yeah. seven. You had so, a good base. Yeah, so I, I had a good motor, um, and I guess all the kind of it was a bit more trans, like transferable than going from indoor volleyball to sevens. Yeah. Going from sevens to league was a bit. Yeah. There was a bit more in common there, um, but still a few differences. But no, I just um, I, I was just like I had that good base fitness from sevens. Yeah. Um, you know, my tackle tech had improved a lot from sevens. Mm-hmm. Um, there was obviously a lot of differences between the two, but. I think I just, yeah, I just really enjoyed the physicality of, of league. Yeah. Um, one of my mates, Ellie, there's a video of it on YouTube, bless her. She got up, oh, she got up, she got smashed by one of our, she got rolled. She'll laugh at me for saying it too if she ever listens to this, but uh, Rowie from New South Wales just yeah. absolutely destroyed her. And I yeah. was like, well, this is league. Like, holy moly. Yeah. Um, welcome. Uh, welcome, yeah. But then just... <laughs> Loved it and got picked up for the Indigenous All Stars team. Yeah, um, and you've done really well there too, captained yeah. last year. This yeah, this year. This yeah, it year. feels like so long ago yeah, now. It now COVID. Yeah. yeah. So this year, captained um, yeah. Indigenous All Stars. Yeah. And how important, um, you know, like I love culture and being able to represent or countries or whatnot. How important is it to? Um, be able to have a platform and a positive one at that um, for your mob oh it's massive and like often you get asked oh you know what jersey means the most to you but it's it's not it's not about comparing Mm. them I think it's just about recognizing that each one's special for its own reason and in its own right yeah and I think the indigenous all stars one is so special in that yeah you're literally representing like a nation of yeah like first people so um and everyone's so invested in it like especially with the women too like you know just to see how much buy-in there are from communities about the women's game like you know mob love it which is so good and yeah um, even a lot of the um like the the male players as well like you know you see them support the women's game too and that's um, a big um that's a big uh difference it's just noticeably uh really league is very well it seems to be very well supported by their men, their male counterparts, which is different to 
union and often when you guys are out touring or going into camps and whatnot is it together or yeah well usually yeah. um so uh, like with the concept being revamped with the yeah. the moldies and and the all-stars like there were stories even last year it was so cool like the moldy um girls and and guys like they did everything together yeah, like okay. um you know it was really cool and even with us like we go to the team functions on the same bus together yeah um, we do a lot of the um like the maybe the health and well-being type presentations together like say for example like Preston Campbell delivered one last year and we went to the boys hotel and we just hang out and yeah um do that with them and yeah go to the team function like there's a lot of stuff where it's yeah it's all together that's um, cool for nines this year like we, you know we did the jersey presentations mm-hmm. oh sorry nines last year yeah um like the corresponding number in the men's team and us we exchange jerseys and yeah. do a jersey preso and like for sometimes you know for some of the girls they're meeting their their idols, idols. yeah and they're like they can't even breathe yeah um so they're so excited and yeah. it's just really cool to yeah to see and i think it's like cool. someone like mal meninga and even our our Jullaroo staff are yeah. really good at um i guess creating, creating that culture yeah, yeah that is that is cool i just want to touch on um something you did mentioned just there around um the Preston Campbell and the well-being health and well-being workshops because I know of, um there's a lot of, a lot more workshops coming about to uh, help out with players and off-field behavior or, or situations and whatnot and I did sort of want to segue into that type mm. of thing anyway so how important um are those workshops are they for you or are they for um you guys to deliver out into your communities or little, both or, or what's yeah. yeah what is that for you a little bit of both like each nrl club kind of has their own nrl state of mind ambassador which okay. is really good so yeah. uh, there are elected kind of um, players in the in the clubs who uh, might go and do some community work and things like that or be a representative of their club yeah um, and then there's a, a whole kind of you know um, state of mind program as well for for players you yeah. know and making sure that the players know that they're really well supported that yeah. they've got the right supports in place mm. um whether that's through mental health whether that's retirement whether that's finances whether yeah. that's you know could be anything yeah um, and the same with the women like we've got a um we've got a health and and well-being um person yeah. uh debbie who's, yeah. who's amazing she yeah. she touches base regularly with everyone okay. um, she's absolutely amazing um and I think just having someone there yeah. constantly is really good. and Like a point of contact. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, and it's a big focus, I know, for, for the NRL in particular. Like in Preston, he shares his story through it. And it's so emotional. Like, yeah. you know, like, and it's it's very public, so he won't even mind me talking about it. But, you know, going from that, that lowest point of, of depression where, you know, yeah. you, you do, you try and, you know, you try and take your own life. And then, yeah. you know, those supports are put in place around you and, you know, now he's now he's just absolutely amazing and he's got no oh, okay. shame in sharing yeah. that because he knows it's going to benefit um players and and yeah. whoever it may be in the in the long run which is really cool yeah and do you see a shift like i know obviously like you and i know um, like my experiences uh in sport were but have been amazing but also had some really low points and that was in a different code and that was really um you know that was that was pretty shit for lack of pretty a pretty brutal for you yeah yeah and it, and it can be quite damaging um and obviously that was in the early stages of a program at a at a national level um nothing there's nothing at the time at community levels do you notice the difference in the in the codes? Because I, like, from my perspective, I feel like there's always um, it was almost like a little bit too much too much of a radical movement for people to speak out about it in union um, until recently in league. Do um, you think it's different? I, I I definitely think so because even just kind of thinking back to kind of playing at, at a grassroots level and yeah. the just like the information that was kind of disseminated and yeah like I like around mental health whereas I can sit in say a burly um, training session and be yeah. fed information that's come right from the top quite regularly about yeah. mental health and 
Um, yeah, I think there is a, a difference, and I think as well because there have been, I guess, um, people or players, both past and present in NRL, who have made mistakes or, yeah. you know, have not even made mistakes, have made mistakes and learnt from them, but also have had their own battles with yeah. mental health and yeah. they've been quite public. Yeah. Um, and been able to turn it around yeah. or just been able to, I guess, have the support network. 100%. And whilst you never want things like that to happen yeah. in the first place, um, you never want someone to take their own life. You know, you never want someone to feel like they don't have any support. Um, you know, the I guess the, the, the light at the end of the, the tunnel for that, that, type of um, stuff is that now there's so much education yeah. around around it and I think um, whilst you know you can always say there should be more there should be more there should be more you know yeah. I think we're heading in a, especially with you know rugby league we're heading in a really nice direction yeah. with it um, but mind you like the media can just chop stuff yeah. like that down so quickly so yeah. um, but yes. you know there's lots of education which yeah. is good is it I I look or I uh, I guess looking back into your sporting career and still quite young, 25, six, six. old girl now, 20, <laughs> old, oh my gosh, um, you know, for uh, the last 10 years or I guess a little bit less, you've had a pretty colourful journey, uh, you know, three, four uh, international represented um, achievements chopping and changing relocating um, you know family illnesses like things like that is it something that's ever affected you um, you know to a point where those resources are not necessarily needed but is that something that that you ever had to battle or how did you actually already have the like built-in um, strategies to because that's a lot to take on you know we're all only human everyone has a breaking point um, you know what were the things that did help you get through such a you know <laughs> mix and mm. oh, you know what I mean oh 100% yeah. I think um, like I definitely did feel those emotions yeah. um, probably especially when yeah when mum got sick and kind of had her own mental health um, difficulties that she was going through yeah. I think I harbored a lot of anger like a okay. lot I, I probably had an I definitely had an anger Just management program funny because you have on the surface wouldn't hurt a fly to, you know a really gentle uh, sort of persona about mm. yourself so again obviously yeah. that was all deep down Very inside deep down yeah, yeah. and I probably um didn't address that for a long time um I probably just shunned that away and didn't kind of make that um obviously public public knowledge but no I completely and probably still to this day still struggle a little bit with with anger which is crazy to think um and have uh like have you know did see someone as well when I was going through that with mum Mm. um because you know mental health can affect so many different people especially you know within a family dynamic too yeah. um, and seeing mum go through that obviously there was a lot of anger yeah. um, on my behalf and then um you know coming to terms with the fact that I was a you know now I look back on it and I'm like why was I so anxious about it but you know kind of yeah coming out if that's the term you know that's always a bit of an anxious kind of yes. moment yeah. uh, to in someone's life you know that fear of rejection that fear of and as judgment. a young person that's yeah that's pretty massive um that is yeah and I forgot about that yeah because obvious like it was now it seems so like insignificant that it was even uh that it's even a top of topic of conversation for us to talk about talk yeah. about but that's right it yeah that would have been a big part of your journey and emotional and, and that sort of thing as well yeah that was huge like that was massive and I was right um and that's what I think I finally felt less fear and less chance of getting judged because I had a yeah. really solid group of friends in yeah. both volleyball and rugby union who right. I could trust, who I knew mm. wouldn't judge me. Yeah. Um, and no one did. Like I, yeah. And I know not everyone has that story, that really nice story of coming, coming out, out to friends and family. But, um, 
yeah, I was just really quite lucky that I had a good support network. So that as soon as I, you know, as soon as it was out, I was like, oh, that's great, you know, I can move on. But um, yeah, that and then I guess, you know, the breakdown of, sorry, I'm rambling on here, but no, it's the break- fine because that's sort of like what our journeys are, rambling yeah. of yeah. like going through and things that seem so uh, like minuscule back now back then were like monumental yeah so, yeah and then like yeah I guess you know there was so mum and then coming out and then um, obviously the the difficulties and you know the highlights of being in a um, I guess a relationship and yeah. managing and forming relationships with friends and um, you know partner or whatever it may be like that's also tough and you know um, I was in quite a long long relationship yeah and, you know all, all relationships take a toll on on your mental health in one way or another whether or and not you have, think yeah they yeah, have their highs and lows 100 percent um so that was another one um and then i guess most recently um probably just around i guess now that i am getting older um i'm getting a little bit more i guess um i guess anxious would probably be the word like i think i definitely have a bit of anxiety and again you know started to to talk to someone and see someone about my kind of anxieties yeah. and yeah. things like that and that was good and again like I'm happy to talk about that but yeah like I guess having that kind of anxiety around different things and yeah. not being able to shut that off and um and I'm not putting that down to age but that's just that's just you know there's things in life right now that are getting real and I'm getting to an age where um, I'm just more aware. Yeah, more aware. I'm probably going to transition. But at the time, I totally wasn't aware that I was dealing with all this anxiety. So, yeah. yeah. And at the time, I think as young people, like I know for myself, like went through however long it was and then finally was like given this diagnosis and then was given like a set of tools to be, uh, you know, to say, look, this ha- th- this sort of strategy can help manage this. And you're doing perhaps, you know, behaviours like this because you've actually got this. And, like, to me it was such a, like, it was almost like a relief, like, oh, this is actually a thing. And, like, Mm. not that it's not normal, but it's actually, like, you don't have to always feel like that, I guess. Um, But it's just within sport. I know for me sport was always my outlet and it was a really cool way to mask it yeah. nobody had a clue that all sorts of things were going around in the space of my head by myself because mm-hmm. everyone just had you know this little picture of me um whatever and it yeah. and it is uh it is quite cool now and it's still obviously like a work in progress but it is cool now to be like, oh, I feel anxious, mm. but I recognise or whatever. Yeah. And I hope maybe that that's what, you know, you'll be able to navigate your way through and yeah. you know, find out things because it's tricky. 100%. And, like, yeah. there's things, that's probably, like you said, about the journey is that, like, there'll be things that you can just work out yourself and you can yeah. overcome yourself. There'll be moments and emotions and feelings and... Um, low points that you go I can crawl out of this myself or maybe I do need some help and I think now that I'm older I can maybe recognize when those times those times are a bit more clear-cut like oh no I can deal with this by myself or oh no I need you know my partner's help or I need my friend's help or I need something and um so you're learning your support networks which is funny because you're often they're already there mm. sometimes you just again like you just need to be made consciously aware of it you know you have to have those conscious thoughts like you said like I need my partner right now or I need this group of friends yeah or, I need to be by myself yeah or which whatever is, it might be yeah which is why like such good healthy relationships are so are so good and I think that's why having a different yeah. you know different different friends and um you know being able to do things with different people is so important and not kind of you know segregating yourself and isolating yourself and or or attaching yourself to like you know one particular person because yeah like you said you know there's only so much that everyone can take and it's the same with someone who you're leaning on too so you know we've all got our own um, buckets and if you kind of fill yours up or someone else's up too much then it's gonna overflow overflow (laughs) it's over yep that's so cool and i'm i'm so 
thank you for sharing that because it's such a uh you know it's massive like to to think that people can actually go through uh these and have all these successes without having things like that Mm -hmm. and sometimes it does take you until you're older to realize like oh actually i do need a a bit of a hand up for xyz and Mm. i know i'm the same and it's 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 just it's refreshing to hear um, Mm. you be able to share that which is cool and and like you were saying before like you know say with your um like with um your indigenous communities and having those platforms now you're in a position where you're able to share um or hopefully like they can hear you say that and and you know things resonate and hopefully people are more comfortable with finding good relationships or you know going to get help if they need it and, mm. and that sort of thing so which is ultimately what this is all about so yeah yeah, yeah. thank you for sharing that that's okay yeah and i i guess that that's sort of like a nice sort of way to tie tie things up because mm. we've covered a lot you know in a pretty condensed amount of time um but i i am going to um as i go through and talk to all these different um sportswomen um be sort of wrapping up with with two things um that hopefully will uh people will be able to make connections with so the the first one is um best best life advice um doesn't have to be within the sporting arena just life i think um definitely the definitely living without living outside your comfort zone and being yeah. okay with being uncomfortable or being comfortable with being uncomfortable sorry is yeah. is probably the the big one like some of the best decisions i've ever made have also been the hardest um yes. and they've been so far outside my comfort zone but now my comfort yeah. zone is is massive so for example last year like i i moved down to the to the roosters um i moved away That's from right. family and friends yeah. and my teammates who i play with regularly throughout mm. the season and it was one of the best decisions i've ever made i made a whole new group of friends yeah played some some okay footy which was good <laughs> um thing. yeah but yeah i think just get get comfortable with being uncomfortable cool and number two um what is your hope for the future of young females in sport just that I think regardless of whether you know you're you're an elite athlete or whether you just you, you just play sport for fun I just want to see young girls encourage support um, and yeah just encourage and support each other um, on their journey in sport no matter how long it is yeah. um, and then at the end of the day you've got lifelong friends who can who can be part of your journey and you know be people who you can connect with for a long time yeah that's so true and and that's a nice again to tie up for the second time (laughs) (laughs) no that is a good way for us to finish because you know you and i've been good friends for a long time and that is why um ultimately i asked you to be a part of what i'm doing and um and your story um it i think it will resonate with a lot of people and i i've enjoyed being um a part of your journey and I'm also um, super appreciative that you've been there um, for mine as well so uh, that's our first podcast for some done dusted um, and thank you Talisha for um, getting this first one out for us anytime Kerb thanks for having me no worries done <laughs> <laughs>